Okay. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem Muhammadin al-Ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd So inshallah today we'll be continuing with our um, our discussion on um, Surah Al-Takathur the tafsir of Quran chapter 102 the chapter of rivalry they call it um, competition in attaining wealth attaining good things children competition in facebook likes competition in followers competition in money in grades in positions so all these worldly things that divert us from our purpose of life all these worldly things that take us away from the reality of our creation all these worldly things that take us away from forgetting why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us. Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I created man and jinn not except that they should worship me. Okay? Except that they should worship me. So that worship is something we should incorporate in everything we do as Muslims. In every single thing we do as Muslims. So anything that takes us out of that worship, anything that is going to divert our attention, and make us want to lose our iman and reduce our relationship with Allah, that becomes part of a takathur. And the Prophet has mentioned in the hadith that the son of Adam will never be satisfied. Even if he's given a valley full of gold, give him a valley full of gold, he will ask for another one. Give him another one, he will ask for another one. And nothing would fill his mouth except when he dies and the dust in the grave enters his mouth. Okay? So this is the reality of... Um, the son of Adam, the nature of human beings. We are never, we are insatiable. That's how the economists say it. We are insatiable because, so till we die, we should never, the lesson is we should never expect to achieve everything we want. Some people will say because of poverty, just give me only 20 million, my life will go better. Now like, give them 20 million. You know, go reach one month, you don't define another 20 million. So these are all distractions and things that will take us out of the realities of our lives. So as Muslims, we try as much as possible to stick to Allah's doctrines with patience, with tawakul. We don't find quick money that is illegal. That is against Islam because it is takathu. Allah is going to deal with you because you don't even know when you're going to die and face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this surah has taken us through the part of death. And I'm going to review that uh, in the long hadith the Prophet Muhammad sallam, said. So we're in the verse... الهاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون. So I will, I will translate that again. The verse says الهاكم التكاثر. You have been diverted. You have been distracted by all these good things of worldly activities. Is that okay? الهاكم from lahu. Lahu are things that incline to your heart. So it's not only rich people that are looking for money. We said even the poor people who have that thought in their mind. Well, I want hammer, I want hammer, I want hammer. That's all they think about. They have fallen into that category of al-hakumu at So the Prophet said, we'll continue to be like that hatta zurtumul maqabir until we get to the graves. And then it will be done on us. So, um, kalla sofa ta'alamun, he said, you will surely know thumma kalla sofa ta'alamun and then you will surely know and then the 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 shuyukh, the mufassirun explained that the first you will surely know is at the point of death because we mentioned to you at the point of death the angel of death will appear to the person the person will see death in front of him so the person will know i'm about to die so when the person know i'm about to die then that person can see from the appearance of the angel and from what the angel shows him that he's going to paradise or he's going to uh, 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 jahannam hellfire so at that point, when the angel of death comes to you, that is when you know that you've wasted your life and you don't have any time to do any additional thing, not even a split second. That is the first kalla sofa ta'lamun. Surely you... So I'll continue. So the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith, he says, when the angel of death appears, when the angel of death appears to the person that wants to die, if that person is a bad person, the angel will come with a coffin from hellfire. Come with a coffin carved from fire. The coffin is burning. Burning coffin. And he will come in a very fearful manner, a face that is ugly, ugly looking. And he will come forcing the soul out of this person. The prophet described the taking of the evil person's soul as wrapping a cloth, a wet cloth around 
a, 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 a branch of wood or stake that has thorns all over it and then forcing that cloth out of tearing that cloth out of that uh, that uh, that uh, branch of tree that has all these thorns so the prophet said it's going to be a very painful moment and you see this person struggling except if they're in a state of coma where you can't see what is going on but the point is it is a terrible experience for such a people and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that from that kind of experience <clears throat> okay so when that person dies and the soul is taken the hadith continues the hadith says that soul is taken the soul stinks it has a bad smell because of all the bad bad things that person don't you say you know rubby body he only enjoy a bunny only in the do for one night only in a yahoo yahoo only in a they cheat people. Only him they commit zina. Only him they drink alcohol. Only him they know they respect the parents. Only him they kill people. You commit all these sins. They are staining your soul. So when your soul is taken, your soul start to smell. Is that okay? Your soul start to smell. Um, Haja Aisha, Haja Hadiza, if you can hear me, somebody is asking for the WhatsApp group number, so you can post it here again for all of them to see, inshallah. So the 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 okay. the, 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 the the soul stinks. The soul smells. Angels will run away from the soul. And normally when you die, they're supposed to take your soul to heavens. As that angel is carrying that smelly soul close to the first heaven, the lowest heaven, Allah will scream, take that dirty thing out of here. From the last heaven, the seventh one up, Allah will scream, take that dirty thing back to the grave. I cast it back there and for you to continue its punishment. Allah will declare punishment upon you even before. And you see that soul starts gaining punishment from this life. Is that okay? And it is says in the hadith on the way to the grave, there are certain things that are going to happen. Is that okay? He says on the way to the grave, if it's a good person, he's seen where he's going, he will be telling those people carry him kodimuni, kodimuni. Abemona, hore, mona, hore, when they waste my time, carry me go, carry me go. How can you imagine somebody leaving this earth and is excited? He's happy because of the foundations he has laid on it, because of what he has planned for eternity, the life that's coming after him. He said, Kodimuni, Kodimuni. And the prophet said in the same hadith, either can a sharon, if the person has done evil, he will say, Ya wa ilaha, oh woe upon me. Aina tadhabuna biha, where are you taking him? See, there's a wisdom in that hadith. The prophet said, if he's a good person, he will say, Kare me, kare me, hurry, hurry, take me there, take me there. If it's a bad person, he will say, Woe upon her, woe upon it. He not say woe upon me. He doesn't want to use himself as an example for a bad person. Where are you taking it? He's distancing himself from those kind of people. And that's how we should be. We should distance ourselves. We should plan our hereafter from now. You know, women are very good at planning. They wake up, they have planners. Some men have learned it too. Me, I'm still learning it. I'm not very good planner. They will have planners. They will write everything they want to do. Even for the next... Some women have planned their next two years. Every day by day. What they will shop for the next day. I'm not kidding. They have... They are very good planners. The way you plan those your daily activities, that is how you should be planning your akhirah. How much Quran am I going to recite today? Um, am I going to attend the lecture today? Um, what charity am I going to do today? What good deed am I going to do? This is the time you have to plan all that. This is the time you have to plan all that. So as you plan your worldly affairs, create time to plan your akhirah affairs. Because the akhirah affairs, they are the only things that can stop you from... When you come off for us in the morning, you don't know if you can ever cross the road. If something cannot happen to you. We've seen people who died, not even... They are in their houses. Car crash in the road and come and kill them while they are sleeping in their house. They did, they did open themselves to, to danger. So opening yourself to danger is not the only thing that can kill you. Death can come to you anytime. So you have to start planning. Plan to be a good person because if you are a good person, the prophet said, when the angel of death come, oh my goodness, he will come with 70,000 other angels, all well suited, well dressed, looking good, fine face, come friendly. You will see them like visitors. They will come to you as honorable. They will call you honorable Haja Hadiza, honorable. They will call you good names. It's time for you to meet your Lord, but don't worry. Don't be afraid. You are going to see good things. You are going to see beautiful things. You see the person die, boy, smiling because they are taking the soul, even if it's painful. They use their, you know, spiritual anesthesia on the body to reduce the pain. He said the, the prophet said in the hadith that the, the, the angels will tell them, 
good soul, come out to the forgiveness and pleasure from Allah. Come out to the forgiveness. Do you hear that? Come out to the forgiveness and pleasure of Allah. And the soul emerges. The soul will leave that person like a drop of water flows from a water skin. Just easy. Like that. But come. The person doesn't feel much pain and the soul goes away. And he says that as the angel takes hold of the soul, the soul smells so good, the good person's soul smells so good that other angels are attracted to it. Who, who be that? Who be that? Whose soul is smelling like that? They'll say, ah, it is the soul of Haja so, so, and so. They'll start mentioning you with the best of names. Al-Haji, so, so, and so. They'll start mentioning your name with the best of names. Angels will start coming. Coming, I want to hope. Let, let us see that so. Let us see that so. And then they will take the soul to the first heaven. When they get to the first heaven, they will ask for permission for the gates to be opened. And permission will be granted. Angels from the first heaven will ask, Whose soul is smelling like this? This person is a wonderful human being. This Haja is a wonderful Haja. Which person's soul is smelling? They'll say, Is the soul of Haja or Al Haji or Mr. or Mrs. or Malam or Ustad? So, so and so. Angels will accompany, other angels will accompany the soul from that first heaven to the second heaven. They will ask for permission, the gate will be open. They keep going, more angels, more entourage. Following. This is somebody that does not have one convoy in this life. He doesn't have security. He doesn't have uh, anybody following him on this earth. The only people following him are those following him after his death. Do you want people who will hate you? Just because you have money, they are following your entourage. Is that the kind of entourage you want? Or you want a sincere entourage of malaika, of angels of Allah, soldiers of Allah, bestowing glad tidings on your soul. So these angels will bestow glad tidings of the soul until they get to the last heaven where Allah is. And then Allah will bless the soul. Allah will say, register this soul in the book of Iliyin. It is the book of of the Muqarrabun, those that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, register that soul there. It's a special book for them. Is that okay? He says, and take this soul back to earth. Because from there I created the soul. From there I will return them. And from there I will bring them back. So this soul will not go back to the grave. So the evil soul has gone to the grave since. The, the good soul has received blessing from Allah. And now is going to the grave. And I've told you what happens when they go to the grave. Is that okay? And when they get to the grave, like I said, on their way, they can feel people taking them. Even on the grave, they can see people taking them. The bad soul will be helpless. He will not be able to ask for anything. He will not be able to say anything. He will keep asking, oh, what is going on? Oh, what is going on? Why are you people leaving me here? Why are you people doing this to me? What is going on? But the good soul is smiling, telling you people, bye-bye. Una do well, Bye-bye, yo. I wish you not the best to make you use our own chance well. Oh. But some of us don't learn lessons from this. Some of us still don't learn lessons from this. We see somebody die. Some of us will be will be gossiping in front of dead body. Some of us will be drinking zobo. You'll be drinking zobo, you'll be telling somebody lie in front of somebody that is dying. Somebody just died. Nah, 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 nah. You're already calculating evil. You, your heart is so strong. We need to talk about softness of the heart. We'll find it a special day for that. Your heart is so blocked. As in defense. When they take fence your heart. They fence them. They put barbed wire. They padlock and they throw the king inside the ocean. And now the ocean, don't, the ocean not safe. Eh? Forest don't grow inside. You don't dry. We don't know where the kid is. Some people's hearts are like that. It's abandoned heart. May Allah not give us that kind of heart. That kind of heart that is more like heartless heart than heart heart. May Allah give us a sweet, soft heart. Heart that listens and accepts. Not heart that has been blocked from the message of Allah. So people who don't, who listen to preachings and they don't follow. People who listen to, to, to what um, the, the ulema are saying and they don't follow are people who have strong heart. May Allah save us from strong heart. Okay? Now when you are in the grave... The first thing that's going to happen to you is the grave will squeeze you. The grave squeeze everybody. If you like, be the sheikhest of the sheikhest, of the ustazes, of the ustazes, the al-hajis and gazanga that have gone to Mecca 71 times, or hajjah so, so and so that have spent millions in the course of Allah. Whoever you are, the grave will squeeze you. And we have the evidences from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. He will squash you. 
I will tell you the story of a great Sahabi called Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Ya Allah subhanallah. Who is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad? The hadith says, when they were burying Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, he says, if only the grave will pardon anybody from squeezing, he would have pardoned Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Let me tell you the short story of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. I'll summarize it. It's a long story, but I'll summarize it. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was the leader of the Ansar, the people of Medina, that welcomed Prophet Muhammad sallam when he left Mecca. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was their leader then. So he accepted Prophet Muhammad, he gave him the bayah, he gave him the treaty of protection and fought beside him. And he was injured after the battle of the trench, because of the conduct. And then everybody knew Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was going to die. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was going to die. What was his specialty? You will see his specialty was his love for Prophet Muhammad sallam. Nothing else. His love for Prophet Muhammad was his butterfly effect. And we're going to see how his love for the Prophet and how he stood with the Prophet, how it has turned, um, how it has turned into, oh, somebody said the volume is low. I'm going to work on that now just to make sure everything is fine. I think because the laptop is uh, far from me. Okay, tell me if you can hear me better now, okay? You should be able to hear me better now. <clears throat> All right. So how he, he showed his love for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, this special sahaba, he died. The Prophet cried. They carried him. The sahaba said, Prophet Muhammad, we have not carried anyone as light as Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. As if we are carrying paper. He's so light. The Prophet said, why won't he be light? 70,000 angels who have never come to earth before for any reason. They just left the heavens and came to earth because of Sa'ad bin Mu'az. They are carrying his dead body. So the weight you are feeling is no weight. The angels are the ones carrying him, not you. That is why he's so light. Imagine angels carrying somebody to the grave. Special guest of honor to Akhirah. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After you live 30 years for this life, 25 years, 50 years, maximum 70 years, oh, you're too old, 80 years, 90 something. No, 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 you die. How do you end? Where do you go? Who go follow you? Now those your human being people when they like you now they go follow you go grave. Oh now angels go follow you go grave. I've not even talked about asking who the angels buried without any human being at all. Oh, that's so happy. Another story on its own. He gave his life for Islam. The angels buried him. He said Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh when they put him in the grave the Prophet kept saying, Subhanallah, 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 out of agony, out of pain, out of loss. When the Prophet was saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, the Sahaba started saying, Subhanallah, everybody, Subhanallah, in the whole, that special graveyard, everybody, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. And then all of a sudden, he said, Jazakallahu khairan. The Prophet is telling Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, Jazakallahu khair. Imagine Prophet telling you Jazakallahu khair. That is answer prayer. Allah has given you that Jazakallahu khair already. Not the one we tell each other. Some of us will say Jazaks. Jazaks. What is Jazaks? Not all those Jazaks coming from people. Jazakallahu khair. Coming from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To a dead sahaba in his grave. And then when they finished burying him. The Prophet said, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The Sahaba. His, this burial was such a drama. Sahaba said, what, what has happened again? The Prophet said, Lakadadamma bommatan. He said, the grave has squeezed him. Oh, yeah, Allah. He said, the grave just squeezed Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. The grave just squeezed Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. And that is when he narrated the hadith. He said, if the grave was to free anyone from squeezing, it should have been Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. It should have been Sa'ad ibn So you can post your questions in the chat or on the Q&A session, and we're going to answer them, inshallah. So somebody is still asking in the question and answers about the WhatsApp group and the link. So I think, Haja Hadiza, you can do that. So I'm going to make... Um, I'm going to make you... A co-host so you can see everything I'm making Haja Hadiza a co-host and I'm making Haja Aisha also a co-host so they can do everything they're supposed to do so go to the chat and answer those people inshallah so let me continue sorry for that break now the the the, the condition is 
This guy has been good all his life, but yet the graves squished him. The graves squashed him. And Sa'ad bin Mu'adh is so special to the Prophet to the extent that three years later, after his death, three years later, that everybody has forgotten about Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Three years later, you know when you die, right? they quick forget you. If you never know, no, now if you think, say, you get level, you be chairman, die after one week, you're your children, they don't share your money, they don't forget you. Nobody know, nobody will remember your name again. You are gone, you are gone. And we're going to see the only thing that will remain after you die. The only things that will remain after you die, the Prophet has mentioned, are the Surah Qatul Jariyah, the rebirth, the Amal rebirth, the things that connect you after you die, the good things you have done that continues to reap, to, to, give, uh, to give out seeds after you die. And we're going to come there in that hadith as we go along. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, the Prophet wrote a letter to a king. And the king responded very well. And the king sent a gift to the Prophet. Of a very beautiful rope. The most beautiful rope the Sahabas have ever seen. A rope. A cloth. When the Prophet wore the cloth, you could see designs of gold on it. It was so beautiful. The Hadith said the Sahabas were going around. Back and front. Oh, now wow. We see Jalabi. I see Agbada. See Materia. We see design. You know, something that is catching their attention. So this thing is catching their attention. They kept looking at the robe. They were so excited. When the Prophet saw their excitement looking at his robe, he said, Wallahi, at, are you ajibukum He said, does this, does this beautiful cloak I'm wearing surprising you and amazes you and making you think other, that this is the whole world? He said, Wallahi, la mandilu Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Three years later, he said, this is the handkerchief of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad in Jannah. This is this robe you see that is entering your eye. It's nothing but tissue paper. It is tissue paper. This robe is tissue paper for Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad in Jannah. So all these things you think you are wearing, you wear the most expensive hijab, the most expensive this, if they are nothing. Now what did they tell they clean ground for Jannah? Then imagine what did they wear. That is why the Prophet said, La ainun ra'at, forget nothing to compare. No eye has ever seen it. Wala udnun semiat, no ear has ever heard it. Wala khatrun ala al the bashar, no human feeling has ever felt it. If you think you felt anything about paradise, you are lying. If you think you've seen anything close to paradise, you are lying. No matter how beautiful of what you've seen, no matter how catchy, no matter how amazing, it is nothing compared to the best architect of architects, what the best architect of architects are created to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is more beautiful than the Jannah. Nothing is more captivating than the Jannah. Nothing will keep you amazed and dumbfounded and flabbergasted, as they say, than Jannah. Nothing. And that should be our hope. That should be our target. That should be our aim. So the person is in the grave. When he's in the grave, angels will be in the grave, waiting for him. They'll wake him up. Oh yeah, man, Rabbuk, who is your Lord? That is the first question. The believer will say, Rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. Say, man, Nabi, who is the prophet? Who is your prophet? Say, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You say, Madinuk. What was your religion? Madinuk actually came in the hadith before Manabiyu. Say, my religion, Dini al Islam, al Islam. I worship Allah alone. I submitted to Him. Answering with confidence. Answering with confidence. That's why He said, Bilqawli Thabit. In the Quran, Allah says that these people that believed in us, when they die, we will give them the confidence to answer these questions. And may Allah give us that confidence. Then the angels will ask Him, Kayfa'araft, how do you know these answers? Then the person will say, Qara'tu kitab Allah. I read the book of Allah. Wa amantu bihi. And I believed in it. Wa shahidtu annahu al-haq. And I ascertained and I justified and I witnessed. I bear witness that it was the truth. Immediately he says that. A voice will call from the heavens. Yeah, Allah. He will say, my slave has spoken the truth. So spread out carpets from the garden for him. And open a gate of the garden for him. They will open a window for your grave. So he said, they will open a window in your grave. You see your Jannah from that window. You could smell the good smell of your Jannah. Inside your grave, your grave has turned into mansion, duplex. Nana, they will open up your grave for you. People think you are suffering. You are flexing. You are in spiritual flexing. 
And this is not something you see physically. Not that when you open the grave, you say, okay, this man was a good man. Now I'm busy as a dead grave now, they don't open duplex for me. I go dig the grave, me I follow and stay for the duplex. You don't go see any duplex there. It's a spiritual experience. It's another different, it's the barzakh. It has no connectivity in physics. We say it's a different dimension. That dimension and the dimension we are, they don't intersect. It's like a multi-universe, a parallel universe. So it's different. No matter what you do, you cannot reach those people. If you open the grave, all you go see now, bone or sand. If Allah, sometimes Allah protects some good people that even their skin are still protected. There are some people that Allah has made haram for eggs to even eat their skin because of their righteousness. So sometimes you open somebody's graves after hundreds of years, they are still there as if you put cream on their face, shining. May Allah give us that favor. It is a big sign of the good people that Allah has given Jannah. It doesn't mean if, if you have bone in your grave, you are not having Jannah, please. It's just a special gift that Allah gives some people. Okay? Now, he smells his Jannah. And his grave is expanded. He's now in the duplex. Then what happens? He said, a man will come. Good looking man. And the, man, the person in the grave will say, who are you? The man will tell him, rejoice in what delights. Rejoice in whatever delights you. For this is the day you were promised. And then he will say, who are you talking to me like this? And the man will say, I am your good deeds. And today I am here to keep you company until the day of resurrection. So, inna wa'adallahi haqq. Definitely the promise of Allah is true. And then this person becomes so excited. He starts saying, Ya Rabbi, aqim is sa'a. He says, Oh Allah, I can't wait to, to enter this, my, this breeze that's coming from this Jannah. I just want to go inside. Now, please, let judgment day come. They will start saying, aqim is sa'a. Aqim is sa'a. Let the day of judgment. Let the day of judgment come. Okay? As for the bad people. As for the evil people, what has Allah prepared for them in the grave? There is a million narrations. In our lecture yesterday, I mentioned a few in the hadith of Al-Barzakh, when the Prophet had two people showing him about the punishment of the grave. We saw a man whose head was being broken with a rock continuously. They would break his head with a rock into pieces. The rock will roll down. The person breaking his head, the angel will go grab the rock. Before he comes back, his head is back to the shape. They will break the head again continuous punishment like that until the day of judgment and the prophet said what did the person do they said that person was the person who learns the quran but does not recite it does not practice it and goes to sleep without praying his obligatory prayers we are all victims of this we are all victims of this we have to be careful with our lives we have to be careful with our lives because like this it could be like a film trick for your eye Go be like, say that do you willy willy? No, 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 no. Bam, you are gone. And nobody will be there to save you except your deeds. So, what have you, my condemned? What have you given forth? What have you put forth as collateral? What have you put forth as collateral for this? The next person the prophet saw in the hadith al Barzakh is another man who a hook was put in his mouth and tore his mouth on one side to the back, tore his nose to the back, tore his eyes to the back, then went to the other side of his face, tore the mouth to the back, tore the nose to the back, tore the eyes to the back. Before he finished this side, this side all dry. He came back again continuously. He said, what did this man do? They said, this man is the man that always tells lies. He told so much lies that it spread all over the world. And this is very evident today. <clears throat> and this is very evident today. <laughs> Somebody said I'm looking up. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking up. Know that you're recording. Yeah, I'm recording with a different camera too for the YouTube channel. So that's why I'm looking there. <laughs> so we make a better recording and post it today every day for people who miss to watch. So that's why I'm looking up. But hey, inshallah, don't mind my face. Just be looking at my face, inshallah. Thank you for the for the comment. I like I like our family. I like this family. I like so feel free express yourself. I am a human being. Whether I'm an ustaz or whatever you call me, I'm a human being. I'm like you. I can commit sin like anyone else. I seek for forgiveness. So we are here to relate and communicate and you know interact. Share your feelings. Open up your heart. Say whatever problem you have. And inshallah, we'll discuss about it and see how to help you out. So you can uplift your spirit. You can be a better Muslim. You can be a better person. 
that is what this forum is all about. Is that okay? Nobody is better. Than, even the prophet never put himself above the Sahaba. Not to talk about me. That is nobody me like this. I know who get anything. I know who know how much they might can. I say, well, I have 500 naira or two. I'm nobody. So we are all here to lend the deen. And Allah has just used me as a mouthpiece. To send some of his message to you. And I'm learning myself. I'm taking heed of these lessons myself. May Allah give us the ability to listen. And take heed of what we've learned. And then the prophet said in another hadith. In the same hadith. About a third man. Who was swimming in, in, a, in an ocean of blood. And then pebbles were thrown in his mouth. And he would swim back continuously. He said that's the one who used to deal with usury. With interest. And then those people who were being baked in the oven because they were committing zina. Zina is one of the biggest fitna in this life. One of the biggest fitna everywhere in the world. Women are tempting men. Men are tempting women. Everything is going upside down. It is all over the place. So your ability to be able to control yourself is going to bring you great rewards in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us the ability to be able to withstand that so we don't get this punishment in the grave for hundreds, thousands of years before Yom al -Qiyam. Okay. So talking about the punishment in the grave, I'm going to start mentioning a lot and a lot more. In Surah to tawbah Quran chapter 9, verse 101, Allah says, وَمِمَّنْ حَوْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مُنَافِقُونَ Allah is talking about the hypocrites. He said, in that same verse, it said, uh, um, We will punish them twice. Allah said, the hypocrites will punish them twice. These are special people. In other verse, it said, In al munafiqina fi darkil asfal min al The hypocrites are in the bottomest part of hellfire. Why? Because they are people who claim they are Muslims, but they are not Muslims. They are spies. They came to give information. They are not Muslims. They come and pray, but they are, they are spying. So Allah will punish them even more than the disbelievers. He said, Allah said, I will punish them twice. The twice is one in the grave and the other one in the hereafter. So may Allah save us from the punishment of the grave. Okay. Abu Hanifa says, anyone who says, I do not acknowledge the punishment of the grave, then that person has missed a vital part of Islam. Because the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned several hadiths. Several hadiths. So saying you don't believe in the punishment of the grave, some scholars say can take you out of the fold of Islam. Because there are numerous hadith where the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned the punishment of the grave. Plenty of them. One of them was by Aisha when a Jewish woman, they call them Jewess, a Jewish woman told her, may Allah protect you from the punishment of the grave. And that was the first time Aisha was hearing it. And so Aisha came and asked the Prophet, this Jewish woman told me this. Is there punishment in the grave? And the Prophet said, yes, there is punishment in the grave. And every day, the Prophet from that day kept asking for Allah to save him from the punishment of the grave. Is that okay? So the Prophet said in another hadith, when any one of you dies, he is shown his seat in the hereafter. Morning and evening, if he is among the inmates of paradise, he is shown the seat from paradise. And if he is from the, among the inmates of hell, he is shown his seat in hell. In hell he is shown his seat for hell. And he will continue to see this torment. It's emotional torment. So it's emotional pleasure for those who believe in Allah, for the good people. It's emotional torture. You are seeing where you are going. Your body, oh, I don't die. I don't die. You know when we are little, when they are flogging us. You get the way your mama could, could just show you the cane from far. You know, say you don't mess up. As you see your mama, they wind the cane like this. You know, say there is problem. That is that emotional torture is what that those people are feeling in the grave. And he said, This is your seat until Allah raises you on the day of judgment. Is that okay? Until Allah raises you on the day of judgment. In another narration, the Prophet said, The actions of every dead person will come to a halt after the death, except those deeds you do the sort of cattle jaria you dug a well you gave water to some people people are still benefiting from the water you built a school people are still going to the school you planted a tree people are still reaping the fruits all these good deeds you've done they will continue to bring reward to you in the hereafter or in other hadith the prophet said your children praying for you that is why you need to raise your children islamically some of us we raise our, we raise, we raise our children to be accountants but they don't know how to read fatia when you die who will pray for you who will pray for you he will be counting your money and sharing your money and spending your money going to club and carry women 
and you are there suffering. That is when you'll be biting your finger in your grave. Oh, my Peking. Oh, my Peking. Don't be so. Oh, my Peking. He cannot hear you. You are gone. So guide your children in the path of Islam so that they will know what to do when you are dead. They will know that that is when you need them the most. Their du'as can reach you. Some hadith says their sadaqah can reach you. They can even do sadaqah to jariyah in your name. So the way we raise our children goes a long way to determine what we get after we die. Okay? <clears throat> Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrated that Zaid bin Thabi told him the Prophet wasallam said he was going along with them towards Bani Najjar and they passed through six graves. And he said, does anybody know these people in this grave? They said, yes, they were polytheists. They were kuffar. The prophet said they are being punished severely. He could hear them screaming from the punishment in their graves. That if not that Allah will not, Allah did not make human beings to hear the punishment in the grave. Because if we hear how people are suffering in the grave, we will not bury our dead. Fear no go, let us want bury them again. No, 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 no. May my, may my father come go, they scream like that. I don't want to bury them. It doesn't matter whether you bury them or not. They will still undergo the punishment they deserve. The, whether you cremate them, whether you hibernate them, whether you upload them, whether you download them, anyhow you do the dead body, Allah is in charge. Allah will take care of the soul in the proper manner and the person will still go through the torment or the good thing they're supposed to go through. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Then the Prophet told them, seek refuge from the torment of the grave and seek refuge with Allah from the turmoil that is visible and is invisible. And seek refuge from Allah from the from the temptation of a dajjal <clears throat> I wonder hadith narrated by Anas bin Malik. He said, when a human being is laid in his grave, his companions return and he can hear their footsteps. And then two angels will come to him and make him sit and ask him, what did you used to say about this man, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he will say, I testify that he is Allah's slave and his apostle. Then it will be said to him, look at your place in hellfire. But Allah has given you a place in Jannah instead. So they will show you a place in hellfire. You are supposed to go to hellfire, but because of your good deeds, Allah is replacing your place in hellfire with a place in paradise instead of that place in hellfire. Then if the dead, the dead person will see both of his places, the hellfire and the Jannah place, but a non-believer or a hypocrite will say to the angels when they ask him, what do you used to say about this man, Prophet Muhammad? He will say, I don't know. Who be down myself? Who be uh, Muhammad? Now those uh, people, all those Muslims, they call up, all those Muslim people. You don't know anything. Who be Muhammad? I don't know, but I used to say what the people used to say. I used to dance Azonto. I used to dance Etigi. I used to dance, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, I forgot the name. All these different dance. That's all you know. You used to do what people used to do. You don't used to read Quran. You don't used to. You don't know anything about Prophet Muhammad. They say, ah, it will be said to him. Neither did you know, nor did you take the guidance, Abi. Uh -huh. Then what will happen? They will hit him. The Hadith said they will hit him with a hammer. Hammer that's so big in between his head and his ear. They will hit him that he will cry, and everybody will hear that cry except human beings and the jinn. The iron hammer, in other narration, said will make him enter the ground. The ground will swallow him and the ground will spit him back out for continuous punishment. May Allah save us from the torment of the grave. May Allah save us from the, the torment of, uh, of the hereafter. Is that okay? Ibn Abbas narrated another hadith that the prophet passed by two graves. And he said these two people are being punished, even if they were Muslims. He said one of them, when he pees, you know they clean himself. Now so you go, they use peace they everywhere. You go, they smell peace. You know they sabi clean itself. The other one, nah, I'm a boy. It spoil relationship. Go they scatter. Go they talk about people when here up and down. That is why that person was being punished. So now we are going to see that there are different things that we do that can lead us to the punishment of the grave. So what are the sins that we can commit that can lead us to the punishment of the of the grave? <clears throat> The Prophet ﷺ came one day, he saw the companions, they were smiling, they were happy. You know, so now you all be laughing. <laughs> then the Prophet told them, he said, if you were to increase the remembrance of death and the grave, you won't be laughing too much. Oh. You won't be laughing too much. So people laugh too much. Their whole life, they are just laughing. They never cry one day. So he said, if you are laughing too much, check yourself. It means you are you are being, you are being, al hakum takathur is working on you. You are being deceived by this worldly things. Is that okay? 
He said, if you remember death and the grave, then you will find yourself too busy for what I see. Increase yourselves in remembrance of death, the severe, the one who severs, who breaks pleasures. For indeed, there is no day that comes upon the grave except that the grave speaks. The prophet said, the grave speaks. It says, I am the house of the estranged. I am the house of the solitude. I am the house of dust. I am the house of the warm eating. Yes, warm go shop you. Inside grave, they go shop your skin. Warm. You will be alhaji dan tata, alhaji dan gote, alhaji zanga zanga. Whatever you are in the grave, warm go shop you. And they go finish you. You will be humiliated. You will be nothing. You will return back to dust. So what, are, what is entering your head? What is, what is making you think you are all and all? You are unbreakable. You are untouchable. You are look at America that's untouchable today. Almost 70,000 people have died because of this virus. In my butterfly effect, like you haven't forgot to mention this virus and the way it expanded. It's another kind of butterfly effect. It started with a few people and now they pass, they cross border. Everybody now is catching the virus. Even now we say dog, they catch the virus. Animal, they catch the virus. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us. Now, um, I have to talk about the sins you commit that can lead you to the grave. But because of time, I want to switch now to the name of Allah. Today, we, we started... Um, Assalamu alaikum, Ustaz. I don't know if we have time for names of Allah. We have about 16 questions. So maybe you would want to answer them. Because, uh, okay. We we'll skip names of Allah today and then we can do that tomorrow. Okay, because okay. The questions don't keep coming in. I don't know. What okay, do so let's, let me go to the questions, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. We understand that when the body is buried, the soul will be returned and he or she will have footsteps of those who came to bury him. Does this mean that the person will wake up like someone that has been sleeping and have the same feelings like a living human being? He will wake up for sure, but will he have the same feeling like a living human being? That is not clear. Like I said, the dimension is different. It doesn't mean if you go and dig the grave back, you will see him alive. Then you can carry the person home. Uh -huh. You know, they happen like that. Uh, he don't die, he don't die. So he said he will be woken up, he will wake up, but he will be in a different dimension. So his questioning is not anything a human being can interfere with or a human being can see directly. And only Allah knows how he does that. So, Salaamu Alaikum, please. We don't have the other link. Okay, I think they've answered that. The link, um, you can check the chat section. There is link for the daily tafsir. It's the same link every day. Just click on it every day, 3 p.m. Except Fridays, we have a break, so I go rest. Make a rest too. And I know they use for it. I know before they use. Uh -huh. Salaamu Alaikum. Why did the grave squeeze Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? Because it is the nature. The scholars say, because we were created from dust, and the grave is dust, it's like a welcome. Welcome back. You know when you do welcome back, when you lose your SIM card, and you go and do welcome back, the, the phone will grab your SIM card. So that welcome back is the grave. I say, welcome, dust, come back to dust, you know? So it's natural for everyone. So it's it's something that, um, it's a natural thing. The grave squeezing, sometimes it's a punishment. So squeezing ones is for everybody. Multiple squeezings are for bad people. So who you are, the grave will squeeze you once at least. But if you are doing bad things, then the grave will squish you more. We're going to see more hadith when I continue my tafsir tomorrow, this tafsir continues the journey in Surah Al-Takathur. I'm going to take you through the journey of the grave up to the resurrection, up to Yom Al-Qiyamah, up to Jannah, and up to Hellfire. That's what we are going to learn throughout the Surah. We're going to learn everything about that so that we equip ourselves with enough Iman to take us through our journey of this life so we plan how to better our life and plan ahead. Is it possible for someone to dream, to have a feeling of being in paradise, like they died and was there. Of course, you can do that. You have five. I personally have had such dreams before. I have seen prophets in my dreams. I have seen people in my dreams. It's possible Allah give people that kind of experience. It's sometimes it's a warning. Sometimes it's a glad tiding. Sometimes it's a call to action. Hey, watch your action. I dreamt a very horrible dream I shared with my Abuja family in Aluda one time where I died and I saw hellfire. I saw it was so real. I thought I was really dead. So it was a wake-up call for me. So sometimes Allah shows us things in our dream to either soften our heart or to make us, to encourage us more to, to practice the deen. What does it mean when the hadith says the angels wake him up in the grave? I've already answered that. They wake him up. It means he can see the angels. He's awakened. But we don't see him waking up because even those people that don't bury their dead, they put them in the mortuary for months, for weeks. They have been questioned. They have been tormented. They're in the mortuary. So, but you in the mortuary can't see. You don't know what. It's a different dimension. 
So it's not that they wake up and then you can see them. Like I said, you're not going to wake up, come out, they go, you don't wake up, or more, go back to this world, or beg, I beg, I beg. You cannot do that. No, they happen. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum, I have two questions. Is the niyyah for fasting done daily or just the start of Ramadan? Anyone you like. You can do daily, you can do the start of Ramadan, that I want to fast for the whole month, except if I see my menses, or you put all those conditions and just do the niyyah, or you can do niyyah every day, every night, whichever one you do is acceptable. Is it necessary to say Bismillah each time you read the three calls? And doing the niyyah doesn't have to be, sorry about that, doesn't have to be by word. Oh, I'll now wait to, no, you don't have to, just in your heart, it's fine. Just waking up for suhoor, you've already made niyyah you want to fast, you know? It's just like for every salah. You don't have to say na wetu, salatu, subuhi, fereda, ikhida, abil, imam. You don't have to say all of that. Just that you make your wudu already, you have the intention to pray. So that's what intention means. Is that okay? It's not you have to say it out loud. The only intention we say out loud, I think it's for hajj, that the prophet said out loud. And I can't remember any other part that the prophet said out loud. Is it necessary to say bismillah each time you read the three calls in the morning? After Fajr, no, Bismillah does not, it's not just the Kulhu Allah, I had Kulhu Azbar Bifak, it's fine. Bismillah is not, but if you say Bismillah, it's an added advantage. Yes, I mean Bismillah when reading Surah Al-Ikhlas three times, Falak, no. Bismillah is not uh, compulsory. You can just read them, you can put Bismillah, it's also fine. During the process of the compression of the grave, if by any means the grave was docked, can people see the compression? I've said no, it's not... The compression of the grave is not something that is in our dimension. It's not something you can feel. That when you are standing in front of the grave, you see the grave moving. No. It's in a different realm that we cannot interfere with. When you don't cover yourself, that is your hair, but you are a good Muslim, can your good deeds cover for the sins of not covering your hair or being hijab? Only Allah can answer that question. That is why, that is why you have to be careful. You are not sure. The prophet says some people not do any good at all. They will enter paradise. But you are not sure if you are going to be among those lucky people. So why take the chance? Why not do what you are supposed to? Why not do the correct thing? And then hope for a last mercy. So what you do, don't take that. It's, it's called forceful hope. Don't give yourself forceful hope. Allah can destroy all your good deeds just because of that hair you didn't cover. So it can turn the other way around. So you don't want to take that chance. So what you should be doing is trying to do better with your hijab. Trying to cover. So Allah will see that you are trying. Not that you say, I know we'll cover. This one go save me. Now you the safe person. Person where the safe person don't tell you, saying go save you. So when you don't have any any uh, authentication, any guarantee from Allah, do what you are supposed to do as much as you can. Because even those people where wear hijab, that worship Allah, they can still be punished. Talk less of you that they say, I will not do this, I will not do this one. So you want to try to do the best you can every single time. Okay, so I'm glad that you're a good Muslim. So just try to work on your covering. Is that okay? Try to work on your covering. Next, if someone was good in dunya, but his good deeds are not enough to save him, when others in the world are praying for him, can those prayers save him from hell? Of course, we've said that the prophet said that already. I mentioned that. Who prays for those that don't have any children? That's why many imams, they when they pray, they pray for all dead Muslims. Every Muslim that have died, you know, it's a general prayer. May Allah forgive all Muslims, all dead Muslims may, from Adam. Some even pray from Adam and may Allah. So it's a general dua, but it becomes more specific and it makes more sense when people pray for you specifically. It increases your chances. Okay. Salam alaikum. We are still waiting for the WhatsApp number. Okay, Haja. Uh, let me see if I can copy it here. The WhatsApp number. No, no Ustaz, wait. Um, the WhatsApp number is the person from Lagos or, or Abuja because I want to actually put out an announcement. The WhatsApp number is for Al Huda, and then if you are FID from FID Networks, then they can um, just get the. Oh, they can contact Haja Aisha, from, right? From your yeah, from Aisha, Haja Aisha or from the YouTube channel, because really the WhatsApp is just for reminders for the program. Oh, I see. So the WhatsApp number is for the Al Huda attendees yeah. from Abuja. Then those that are joining us from Lagos, Haja uh, Aisha will communicate to you. Haja Aisha, you can hear us, right? Hadja Aisha, are you there? I'm trying to unmute her. Salam alaikum. Yes, I can. Okay, that's good. Yes. That's good. We thought Ramadan has hidden you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So the Lagos people, do you have something for them? Is there a group, a WhatsApp group they can join? No, there's no WhatsApp group, but I shared the link and I think a lot of them are on 
Okay, they can get the link. Okay, inshallah. So maybe you start thinking of WhatsApp group like Alhuda. Uh, no, there's really no need for the for the WhatsApp group. Like, like you just said, it's just a daily reminder. The daily to reminder. Join the class. Yeah, okay. So. Khair, inshallah. But if you want to relocate, you want to relocate from Lagos to Abuja, you can relocate so that they will, you will not be eligible. So they will add you for the <laughs> for the WhatsApp group. <laughs> okay, now let's continue. <laughs> um. Can you make surah called jariah for a non-muslim parent oh sorry sorry non-muslim forget just leave that one for allah if he's non-muslim you can't even pray for them just leave it just leave it for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not our business that is above our our how do you call it our pay grade It's above our pay grade if someone is cremated and i have we have evidences for that i'm not being wicked i'm not being harsh right now i'm sorry if i answered it harshly but the point is prophet ibrahim a prophet himself Try to pray for his dad who was non-Muslim. Allah told him that his dua will be of no essence. You know? So the thing is, you had time. Try your best in this life. When you have relatives that are non-Muslims, some of us, you know, I had an American friend. He became Muslim. He, he spent all his, he was 18 years old. Only 18 year old boy. He became Muslim from reading and asking questions. He spent his, all his time in the masjid, in my university. And then he went home to visit his Christian family and he came back. And I asked him, how's your family? He said, they are in trouble. I said, what do you mean they are in trouble? He said, they are in trouble of hellfire. He, you can see he's worried. He's so worried about his family being non-Muslims. So that is how we, some of us don't worry. We'll buy a bag of rice for our mama. We'll take it, and our mama will be Muslim. I'm not saying don't take, care of, don't take care of your mother, but you should be more concerned about their Islam than just feeding them and giving them all they want. They need Islam more than all those things you are giving them. So treat them well. Allah has asked us to treat them well, even if they are not Muslims, but give them the most important thing they need, the da'wah, to call them to Islam. And sometimes your character, your attitude, the way you take care of them can call them to Islam. We've seen people who left Islam because of how their fathers treated them. They went to the religion of their mother, who is a Christian, because their father was always talking bad about their mother, and their mother never talked bad about their father. So we have all these things that can come into play. As a Muslim, we have to be careful. Our characters, our attitude go a long way to determine how people see our religion. Uh, if someone is cremated or not buried, how will the grave squeeze him? <laughs> Don't worry. Those that have been cremated, they're already facing their own death. <laughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how to take care of those. Is it true that the angel of death is shy to take a child in the presence of his mother? Allahu a'lam. Maybe there's a hadith on that. I have not come across it. But uh, yes, angel of death has feelings. Like the, Allah himself said in the hadith that he, he sh he's shy to take the soul of his servant, who is his wali, who is his friend. But for the angel of death taking the child in the presence of the mother, I don't know any narration about that. I have a question regarding dreams. Sometimes I have nightmares in which I can feel something bad coming. But I'm unable to say out the Bilal in Shaitan Rajim or the Shahada. Is there any deeper meaning behind this? Um, well, I'm not a specialist in interpreting dreams, and uh, but the point is, when you have nightmares and you wake up, then there is a dua you say. Is that okay? So we have the dua the Prophet enjoins us to say three times and blow air to the left three times, saying out the Bilal in Shaitan Rajim, wa min sherri ma ra'ait. I seek refuge in Allah against shaitan and against the evil of what I have just seen in my dream. So the Prophet has taught us this dua to say when we have nightmares. So even if you can't say out the billah in your dream, while well, that is how when you wake up and you are all sweaty, you are all scared, say this dua, out the billah min shaitan rajim wa min sherri marait, and blow air three times to, uh, to your left and change your sleeping position. Is that okay? And hopefully um, you will be saved from that nightmare. Sometimes my dreams come true. Is there an explanation for that? Hey, you're a special person. So hopefully your dreams are good dreams. There are people like that, that their dreams come true. Allah created us differently. So don't think there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. But the only problem with those kind of people is when they see something in their dream, like I'm coming to someone, they start getting scared. So when you dream and you know your dreams come true, you dream that somebody, some, something is going to happen to that person, pray. You don't have to tell the person. Just pray for the person or tell the person to give sadaqah or just do something for Allah to protect the person from such thing because from your experience, most of the things you see in your dreams, they come true. My friends are Christian. Should I be worried? Oh, of course, be very worried. Be very worried because when they go to bulala them, you pity them. So be very worried. Okay? And you should try to make more Muslim friends. Okay? Make more Muslim friends. 
I'm not saying cut ties with your Christian friends. Be friends with them. Still be nice to them, but pity them. Sometimes when you are talking, try to talk Islam to them. Try to tell them about Islam. Don't argue with them. Like I said, don't argue that their religion is bad or no. Just tell them about your deen and why you think Islam is a better religion and why you are a Muslim. You know, give them little da'wah often here and there. What is the best way to tolerate someone that's staying in your home that you don't like? <laughs> this question is complicated. <laughs> First of all, who is that someone? Is it your mother, your mother-in-law, or your friend, or your maid? Uh -huh. Because the answer to this question will be different depending on the person. And then, what do you mean you cannot tolerate them? You just hate them because you are a bad person yourself, or they are bad people and that's why you hate them. So there's a lot of complications. There are some people, they don't like people naturally. Some people are evil. They don't like anybody coming to their house. They don't like anything. What are you doing here? Get out. Some people are like that. So this question is a very complicated question. So if you know you don't your your cupboard is clean, you don't have any skeleton in your cupboard, but this person staying in your house is giving you trouble, and is it somebody you can do away with? Is it an employee you can say, oh sorry, you can't work with us anymore? So it's a very complicated question. In fact, it's a topic for another day. So, but the best point is, if I understand the question very well, let's say you are a good person, you don't have any problem. This person is giving you problem, maybe your mother-in-law or whatever. Try to sort it out with your husband. In a systematic way, try to discuss things, do sure in it, and sometimes you might have to sacrifice some things yourself. You don't want everything to be in your favor. Is that okay? Sometimes you might need to be patient and sacrifice some things for peace to reign in such a second. It might even be your husband that you are tolerating. It might be your wife that you are tolerating. So, like I said, the question is a very complicated question, and it can affect a lot of people. Can we pray for the departed who didn't die as Muslims? I'm sorry, you cannot. My husband's mom was a Christian. His dad was Muslim. I usually make dua for both of them. Make more dua for the dad. The mom is left for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sorry. It's a bad news, but there's nothing we can do about it. We all had our chances in this life. That is why when you are living, try as much as you can to also preach to others. Try to save them before they die. It is your duty. Is that okay? It is your duty. What of those of us that are based internationally in the UK, for example, are you talking about WhatsApp number or you are talking about link? The link is for everybody, whether from UK, anywhere you can join the link. But WhatsApp group is for Abuja people for daily reminder. So if you move from UK to Abuja, we will join you for WhatsApp group. But don't come now because there's coronavirus. Northern Muslim women typically don't cover their ears and neck when dressing. <laughs> don't come and cause problem for me. <laughs> Our neck and ears show, but everywhere else is covered. How bad is this? The simple answer is very bad. Simple answer, very bad. But I won't go into details. Some of them are trying. Some of them were not even wearing hijab before before they entered the ear and the nose not showing or showing ear. So we encourage them to keep going gradually until they reach that final step and final level. <clears throat> so, it's time for prayer. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, okay, inshallah, um, maybe I will, I will take a note of these uh, questions. And maybe we'll continue with them tomorrow, inshallah. Oh, there's, a, there's some really um, important questions here. I don't know if the people can, can we the same time. Yeah, yeah, those who want to leave can, can leave. We can spend another five minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll spend another five minutes to answer questions. Those who need to leave now can leave for salah. Well, let me try and rush through the questions, okay? Yes, please. See, I'm about to complete the Quran, inshallah. Can you advise me? on whether to go on and aim to complete or should one aim to have an understanding the Quran. Yeah, complete the Quran. Reading is the first step. Then understanding is the next step. Understanding is more reward. So if you want to spend your time understanding more than reading, it's okay. But the best is to combine them. While you are reading, you are understanding and you are memorizing. But it's a step at a time. A step at a time. Memorization is the highest level. Memorization and understanding is the highest level than just reading and understanding. And reading and understanding is the next level than just reading without understanding. Then Alif Batasa is the next level. Yeah, it's the small level, Alif Batasa. So, so Alif Batasa, you start reading, you, then after reading, you start understanding. After understanding, you start memorizing. After memorizing, you now know the Tafsir also. So just go gradually at your pace and it's a good thing you are bringing it up. Just be motivating yourself. I'm currently engaged to a Christian. He treats me better than all the Muslim men I have met. What are your thoughts on this? And you've not met better Muslim men. You've been messing with uh, bad Muslim men. Bad Muslim men. They are very bad Muslim men and they are very good Muslim men. Some of us lose hope. 
We we'll experience one man. Oh, all men are like this. We we'll experience another man. All men are like this. No, I'm not saying they are no good Christians. They are very good Christians, even better than many Muslims. Very correct. But be careful. Don't lose hope. Pray to Allah that His religion will finish you. By the time He takes you into Christianity, then all those good things He's doing to you, you become a Christian. You now discover that He will take you with those good things to hellfire. Is that okay? So it's better you are patient and keep searching. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you make dua, will bless you with a good Muslim man. Is that okay? <clears throat> good. <clears throat> then the next one. It says, um, What about, what do you do if you constantly see a dead person in your dreams? Does that mean the person needs dua? It's possible. Many Sahaba saw dead people in their dream and they spoke to them, they did dua, or the dead people advising them to be better themselves. So it's possible. In the Quran, we do is four steps. The hand, face, head, and feet. How come we also wash nose? So wash nose, yeah, amount is the sunnah. So those are the sunnah part. The compulsory part are the ones you mentioned. From Sahub, uh, Faksilu Wuju Hakum, that's what the Quran says. Those are the compulsory parts. If you wash those, you are fine. That still will do is acceptable. But the Prophet also washed his nose, rinsed his nose, ear, and mouth. Is that okay? So those are the Sunnah part. And it is a more complete wudu. So if you wash without those Sunnah parts, your wudu is fine. But the person who washes those Sunnah parts has extra rewards compared to you. I was brought up by a single Christian mother who made sure I grew up as a Muslim with all. At some point in life, when she spoke about going for Umrah with me to become a Muslim, she became sick with dementia and was bedridden till she passed away. I buried her as a Christian. Does that her intention count? Of course. When she said she wanted to go to Umrah and become Muslim and she was sick, all she needed to do is take the kalima to Shahada. When she says it, even if she doesn't go to Umrah to become, she's already a Muslim and she would have died as a Muslim. So only Allah knows now if her intention counts, that's left for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I would have advised you to bury her as a Muslim since you know she had an intention to be a Muslim, except if you didn't have the power to bury her the way you wished. Allahu A'la. We pray Allah accept her intention and accept her in her favor. Do we have to be in wudu and wearing hijab? When the, no, you don't have to be wudu. Hijab, most scholars say yes, but you don't even have to be in hijab when you are reciting the Quran. But most scholars say you should be. But wudu is not compulsory at all. But if you have wudu, an extra grade for reciting the Quran. About the sister who is engaged to a Christian, should she end the relationship or wait till she finds a Muslim brother? Don't wait. End the relationship because the more you stay in the relationship, the more you start loving that person. And I know how love works. When you start loving, 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 even when a good Muslim brother comes, oh, I beg you, no, 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 this one I like, I beg you, he's my sweetheart, he's my yummy, yummy, he's my this. So please, try to end it. If, if possible, if you love him so much, try to bring him to Islam. Now you kill two birds with one stone. You are not telling him about Islam. If he now comes to Islam, now you, you get him and you get the good things you want from him. Um. Okay. Do you have to perform wudu again after salama when you pass wind? If you no, it's not no perform dhikr without wudu, you are fine. Oh, somebody say can't hear. Sorry, no vessel. I try to raise my voice. Okay, yeah. So you see, we're able to answer all the questions. I think this is the end of all the questions. Let me open again if there's anything missing. No, I've answered all the questions. Thank you all for, for being patient with us and staying with us this time, and inshallah. We'll see you guys tomorrow, inshallah, same time to continue our talk about Surah Al-Takathur. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.